Welcome everybody to Sunshine Coast Open House first event for this year. This is the inaugural Open Architect series and before we start I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today, the Jinnaburra people and the Kabi Kabi Gabi Gabi people. I'd like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging and would like to welcome our speakers to their land. Also like to acknowledge our fabulous sponsors, Inspirations Paint Sunshine Coast, who have made this event possible. So I'd like to hand over to Cameron. Fantastic to be kicking off this series um, of conversations today in this beautiful setting in the Sunshine Coast hinterland. I thought I might get our conversation started by just, uh, you know, getting, getting to know each other. A um, bit of a kind of um, informal start. So I might ask um, Ryan and Paul just to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about their background um, and their experiences in, in architecture. Paul, maybe you should start. Yeah. Uh, well, um, uh, my practice form architectural design is uh, 20 years in now. So I've been doing it for a long time and specialising in residential work, working out of Brisbane, but also working throughout the whole state. So very interested in working in regional place and also in sort of semi-remote locations like this. It's sort of inspirational in its own right. Um, and really it's about uh, coming together with like-minded clients who've got uh, an inspiration to move forward with something kind of unique um, that gives us the opportunity to, to present something new. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, my name's Ryan. I live here with Brooklyn and my son Huntington. We've got um, some family here that live in Mullaney. We've also got um, family that have a farming background up in Cairns. And my family down in Victoria have some farming background further on in generations. Um, which is one of the things that we imprinted on Paul to start with, that we wanted a nice open environment like this. Mm. Um, my background is, is an engineer uh, in the mining world, um, and I currently run my own sustainability practice, advising small and medium-sized businesses on how they can be more sustainable. Mm. Um, but definitely sustainability is a big focus and passion of mine. Mm. And it's hopefully sort of imprinted in the house. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So, of course, the, the question we all want to know is, like, how did you meet? So I feel like it's a bit like perfect match sort of style uh, of question is that, you know, maybe coming coming back from the, the weekend at South Mile Island, you know, <laughs> how did it go? But let's let's start with um, how did how did how did the architect and the client get together in this in this case? Um, yeah, I don't know who the woo were and the woo wee were, <laughs> but um, um, we met at a... We'll call it a bromance. We met, we met mm, nearby here in a cafe and started a conversation. And at that well, we need to go back one step, Paul. The phone rang, there was an the email. Rang. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, there was a phone call and I think we were invited to come up and, and meet um, and just be introduced at a very, very early stage. In fact, um, this will probably be something to discuss further later on, but we weren't brought in to talk about a house at the beginning. We were brought in to talk about site selection. So there were a number of... of potential sites and so before we even got engaged to be the architect on the project we were in in many ways involved uh, as a consultant to give inf information and position on a couple of different options in terms of where Brooklyn and Ryan were thinking of building um, and so that was a very unique opportunity and I have to say there's no way that the house that we're sort of surrounded by today would be the same one had we have gone to one of those other sites so that's, a, that's an element which I would love more clients were in a position to come and talk to us earlier. And it also gave us a fantastic opportunity to, to get to know each other, to understand uh, each other's priorities and, and what we were both looking at uh, when we did our site reconnaissance. It, it was good because um, I had a preferred block that wasn't this one. And this was Brooks' preferred block, so it was a good test for Paul to see <laughs> how he navigated that um, potential conflict, but uh, he actually obviously did a great job in guiding us to this this space. Yeah. Um, but it was a good good um, way to sort of dip your toe in the water and get to know someone before you sort of get taken up by the design mm. aspects of, of building a house. So I imagine, Ryan, you're sitting somewhere at a desk, you've got a list of architects you're calling, um, you're cold calling in the office. What Can you tell me from your point of view, what sorts of questions, what sort of dialogue were you wanting to have in terms of selecting an architect to work with? Um, well, I think we did a short list to start with based on um, the kinds of houses that the architects were building and how we sort of resonated with those styles. Um, and then we kind of 
being an engineer, there was a bit of process involved around, okay, what are, how are we going to do it? Um, how do we, you know, what are the steps we take to get to the end point? Um, but at the end of the day, it was more just to see whether we could relate and talk to Paul and have a proper relationship, given that it was, you know, it's the, you probably only build a house maybe once like this in your life. So we wanted to make sure that we, um, we had a good relationship and we could work through and get to our goals. And those ups end. and downs. We'll, yeah. come, we'll come back and yeah, talk we'll about some of those. Some, those. Had some ups and downs. Paul, from your point of view, um, is it the, you know, it, there's a, a sort of dialogue, is it, is it the architect interviewing the client or the client interviewing the architect? Of course, probably in the best scenario, it's a, a bit of both. When you get that cold call in your office mm. and someone's, Ryan or someone says, I'm interested in doing a project, what sorts of, what sorts of conversations are you wanting to have in that first, that first interaction? Mm. Yeah, well, the first thing is to, to meet in person. So we never make judgments over that cold call because okay. we've been really surprised by some projects which you know, we've communicated one way and they're totally different when different you get project. on site. Yeah. And so we are always endeavor to make that first contact and, and put the time aside. But when you hear somebody has got a, looking at a site you know, in this sort of location, you're, you're already excited. But it, it, I think you you are working out how you're going to work together. Um, it's 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 already about well you know obviously we have a position in architecture we have a kind of belief about how we might go about a process, so we need to see that that's you know something that can be accommodated from the other side of the fence. But at the same time, the one thing that marks the difference between each and every project is the site and the client, and so you're trying to work out who that client is, and then that client really is the inspiration for that project. So. We're, yeah, it is a bit like a dating game in those first couple, but I think you just you, you work through a couple of very simple conversations and spend time together. And if you can walk over a site, of course, then the conversation just takes care of itself. Mm. You used a really lovely expression there, practicing from a position. And it seems to me that in terms of residential architecture, that's a, it's a really interesting um, aspect of the project because you're both practicing from a position as an architect, mm. but also making a home that's specific to a client. And that to and fro between the specifics of a project, as in with client, brief, site, has to be mediated through your own ideas about architecture. And I wonder, as a way of framing up some of our conversations about your approach here, if you could talk a little bit about what is the position you practice from? How, how would you describe that? Wow, oh, that's a big pull. Um, I think I think it's first of all the patina that's laid down when you've been practicing for twenty years. So when you're young, you're you're very keen just to be building and to be making, and then you slowly work out things that work for you, that work for clients, and you want to translate some of that into each and every project. But um, uh, I think in this case, hopefully, it's reflected that first and foremost we have a a massive regard for the environment, for the landscape, for country. Um, from a non-indigenous perspective, of course, but and so we want to understand that we're going to be going into a, a rural or a semi-remote like this, with the idea that we're embracing that landscape and that we're not going to run roughshod over it. So it's almost a moral ground at that point, um, and it's not really about how many bedrooms and and all the other <coughs> aspects of that brief that are going to fashion. It's much more about a general regard for how you want to occupy the site. Um, so there's that, and from us as a practice, I mean we're. We're fairly steeped in a sort of Queensland uh, notion of, of making and building. Um, and we love materials and we love the expression of those materials and we try not to, to cover things up. But I think that those sort of elements we hope clients are seeing because we do have that body of work, are seeing that work and understanding some of those things, whether they understand it perhaps in the disciplines that we might as architects, they're re re responding to those things and, and they're coming to us for that. That's the wonderful thing about having an established practice is people are searching out for you to some extent. Mm -hmm. But obviously there's nothing in our portfolio that reflects on this project uh, specifically. So we're looking um, to be tested. We're looking to go places with new clients all the time as mm -hmm. well. And I think that's absolutely right. If you look back on that 20 year portfolio of work, it is quite diverse mm -hmm. from you know a tree house in a, in a backyard in Brisbane to a project like this on an incredible, beautiful site to through to projects in in North Queensland, so you I mean that practicing across Queensland and in its varying different types of climates locations yes. is embedded in your practice. It's it's something we've actively tried to to maintain. I think from those early days when we were doing work in regional place and then mm. you know really tightly held sites in Brisbane, 
be able to move between those two, the two different sets of projects talk to each other in very different ways. Here it's, it's about establishing outdoor room, which you can occupy at a comfort level with an incredibly immense landscape. In the city, you're trying to find ways of escaping the site to draw the city in to, to magnify the site. So they do things in different ways, but they're constantly talking to each other. Um, but working in regional place with uh, craftspeople, artisans, uh, consultants, builders, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a great joy. It's a great joy. The house is usually the one of the first project an architect works on when they set up their own practice. but. And it's a characteristic, I think, of our architectural culture that architects get to, get to build very early. Mm. So, you know, as a mid-career architect, you've got a substantial body of built work. And how it was, it was how, doing houses and extensions that got you started, wasn't it? It is, yeah. Certainly in the, in the private practice. I was literally leaving North Queensland, coming back to Brisbane and started a project in Mackay. So first project was Mackay and then Brisbane and then in, in other places and doing different things. But I, I think... Uh, what we constantly dally with is looking for more you know, sophisticated briefs and bigger projects. And what we constantly find is that the investment of the client is not there. Then when you work on a residential project, everyone's heart and soul is invested into the outcome of that project. And it's not just the money, it's the, the idea that we're going to live there for the rest of our lives or a good part of it. And, and that can't be replicated in other project work. And so I think we always find ourselves drifting back to residential work because it's very very fulfilling, yeah. So let's let's go back to the brief. Um, you've met. You've there's a meeting of minds. You think this is this is a collaboration that would work for us over the next two three years. Um, what was the brief, Ryan, that you and Brooklyn gave to to Paul in terms of um, the type of place you would like to live in, um, how long you imagined yourself to live there, and then down to the sort of the the, the list of rooms you imagine you might have. What yeah. sort of information did you give Paul? Um, I've got to go back into my memory banks, but it was one page. I can remember it was exactly one page. Um, yeah, my lawyer's got a copy of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, we, our primary um, message from the brief was that we wanted this to be a family house and not just for our own family, but our extended family to come and stay and relax. Hence, it's called Mill Hill Retreat. Mm. Um, so I think a lot of what we put in the brief was around that aspect and how we would, from memory, there was things about like having the orchard and gardens yeah. and stuff and being able to have big lunches with family. And we sort of talked about that. We didn't talk much about rooms at all, actually. I no. don't think we, no. we... A lot of it's aspirational. Yeah. We, so yeah. We, we focused on values, on our values, mm -hmm. on what we liked and... Um, and what about in terms of sustainability? Was there some benchmarks that you yeah, so set there? No, no hard and fast ones other than it needed to be um, material wise, need to be sort of sustainable. And also from an operate, like call it an operation of the house, but um, trying to make it, you know, as low a, a carbon footprint as possible. We already knew that we'd have to have our own water and sewerage here, just based on where we are. But we also then laid in the fact that um, and need to have a lot of solar passive aspects to, to try and get to a neutral footprint. Um, so we did focus on that a lot. So you effectively are off the grid, as it were? We started We started in the first year and a bit, we were actually carbon positive, right. leaving in just Brook and I, and then Huntington came along <laughs> and that changed very quickly um, because, so it's interesting the way we thought of the house when we briefed it, it was just us and we didn't really think we we're gonna have a family. Um, to so we thought more around entertaining and that sort of thing but then when you have a little one all of a sudden you're thinking about are they cold hot at night and that's the, the only thing you focus on is making sure that everyone's at 22 degrees or whatever for yeah. sleep and so our, our electricity bill um, suffered when we were going through that phase but um, luckily the way that we talked through the design with Paul because we took things in and out of scope um, so around windows, for example, and different types of windows, that we still had options to, when I realised we were going to be um, having a, a poor carbon footprint with extra kids in the house, we were able to put a few things in place to, to improve its performance again. So we sort of retinted some windows and, and a few other things. But 
um, yeah, it was, it's been interesting. That's sort of what we focused on is the operation, but we didn't think about it from a full family perspective. We thought about it from our, our own, our own sort of um, experiences living together as a couple. But the way Paul's designed it is it's got heaps of flexibility mm. to adjust as the family gets bigger and it's going to be bigger again when we've got twins coming. So, um, yeah, I'm sure we'll adjust the house again from that perspective. So, Paul, that idea of that inherent flexibility mm. is evident in the plan of the house. You can see how it's it's a, it might adapt over time, for example. That relationship between the operational side, which yeah. I think, you know, it reflects a, a sort of an engineering point of view and combined with the first principles aspects, ventilation, et cetera. How did those, those two, the sort of me the mechanics and the, the poetics of environmental yeah. sustainability sort of match up? Yeah, well, I think beyond that first stage of being introduced to a choice between sites, we were then given a lot of range in terms of where we might divine the placement of the house. And so even though you're, you're replant with all these incredible views, things are also locating the house like orientation and North Point and the depth of that light coming in here. Mm. And there's a real change that, that we had to learn um, being where we are because there's a real micro climb up here. You get a wet uh, winter and you get cold winters and it's not very far away from the coast and from Brisbane, but it's a completely different environment which attracts a, its own expat sort of uh, contingent and uh, I can see why and so that led a lot of the reasoning and a lot of the thought so there is a heart there is a fire that was almost essential mm. I think the the operational brief to me and and even the name of the retreat there was a sort of sense that coming here and making this place was about being self almost self-sufficient mm. and being self-reliant and being placed into mm. that landscape and so I think the poetic and the pragmatic brief met you know re reasonably quickly there was an underlying brief here, though, which I'm not sure you would have recognised so much because this is your one house, but, but Brooklyn and Ryan came to us with an idea that they had been preparing for this house for a long time, not just financially. They'd been thinking about it and putting it forward. And there was an idea also that it was their forever house, that they, they may be here for the whole duration of their life and bring up their family. And that entered in a whole level of commitment, not just in terms of what the outcome would be, but it, it le allowed them to surrender, if you like, some of the preoccupations a lot of people face when they're investing so much money into their home. As in some of the real estate hyperbole that would go yeah, into Yeah, it, and, an and it was much home. more about a commitment about how you might occupy this site and how you might over time grow an orchard or expand mm. a shed or how you do all those things. So, mm. so I, I mean, again, this is all just incredibly rich terrain for an architect to try and tap into that and try and help uh, Brooklyn and Ryan realise that sort of underlying brief. Mm. Yeah. So you're Matt, you're, you've been here a little while now. Yep. In terms of that aspiration of a forever house, has Paul matched your matched your aspirations in terms of the design of the house? Uh, yeah, so it's we're really, really happy with it. And I, we can, I think we knew the answer, Paul, don't worry. We can oh. see, um, <laughs> so it's all jokes aside, I actually do have a 20 year landscaping plan, yeah. which includes revegetation of the, the further extents of the property. So that's sort of, shows you how i guess you're happy with the house so we're committing to the rest of the um call it a build if you like for this property so it's definitely worked out well yeah paul i just want to return to this question of landscape and the qualities of being here um and and don't take this the wrong way that the the house almost entirely surrenders to the power of the landscape here yeah. um, and that the arrival sequence our experience of it today is actually almost um exterior to the built form, yeah, um, and I can just wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about to give to give us a sense of how how special this relationship with the with the landscape is, and in a way how it rejects some of the the maybe more real estate notions about being in the best part of the site, for example, you know, being further up the up the hill. Um, well, I think first and foremost, when you when you're given the opportunity to to place a piece of architecture into a landscape that's that's this almost pristine and ideal like yeah. it's a it's a privilege but it's also onerous i mean what your yeah. your hope and aspiration is that you can bring architecture into these places and through the injection of that architecture you don't diminish that landscape 
you don't take something away. So it, it, in the ideal, you, you add something to it. And that's not just the experience of the house. The house will have that, but will will the landscape itself also survive that? So I think it's a good observation that this house yields to the landscape. It yields to contour. We haven't cut in very heavily. We, we've worked to contour. Um, and I think this central space is uh, incredibly important that, that really from the saddle, from the, the usable um, ridge, you can walk through the landscape and through the centre of this plan and continue out into that landscape is allowing the house to, to, to sort of embrace that landscape. But then it sets up all sorts of interest in terms of the way that two halves of a house might talk to each other. So we're out here in a relatively remote place, but there's a sense of having neighbours through, through this, that you can be here and you can see people in other parts of the house. And, and then mm. this very, very significant space here where we're relying on the architectures to frame so that we can come outside and be in relative comfort in terms of our own self scale and be still fully immersed into that landscape. And so those ideas drive the plan. Uh, it might look like we're doing lots of other things, but it's, it's really about mapping the landscape into, uh, it's a dance, it's a choreography between the plan and the landscape. So even moving through, coming down and through the terraces of the kitchen living room, we introduce you to that landscape at the top, but we, we deprive you of the sky, so it's only a green view. And then as you come down to the kitchen, you're introduced to the cusp of that sky, and then you come down to here and you, you're given more. It's a way of framing, but it's also a way of, of really acknowledging where we are. Hopefully, as you move through the house, you see those other patterns, you know, the mm. moving along contour, setting down. So we're learning from the landscape, or we're trying to, and we're trying to not displace, uh, even though, that you know, a lot of this is made of heavy stuff, but we're really trying to, to hold on to the moment that we first found where the, the flat saddle started to really pick up. And if you weren't watching, you were running down this hill and hoping you'd stop before you fall over the edge. So we, we pushed the house as close to that threshold as we possibly could. And some you know, less brave clients would have had us parked all the way back up there, but we wanted to bring it right forward. So you were, you were right on the edge. You're enjoying it and uh, embracing it and actively engaged with it. I think the the ease at which we're gathered, you know, we are naturally having a um, an informal conversation that's facilitated by the way that the architecture work is kind of in, works is indicative of that. Ryan, you talked about the fact that you and and Brooklyn had a different attitude to which might be the best site. Mm. I wonder, could you talk me a little talk to us a little bit about um, how this why this site ended up being the one. Um, yeah, so the, what I preferred was a, uh, a block on a, on a sloping piece of land that you could see a long way out across the hinterland and over to the ocean right. through a big saddle. So I, I was more into that really, really big vista. Big view. Um, and then when we came here, I mean, I was aware of the different views of this block, but when Paul came and stood here and sort of highlighted the kind of amphitheatre style view mm. you get in this valley, that's when I sort of realised I'd lost the battle. <laughs> um, but, but it was a good one to lose because it's been just amazing watching this, um, this valley. You know, in the morning it looks 10 times different to the afternoon based on the light mm. and the fog, whether the fog's swirling around or, or whatever it's doing. Um, it's, been, it's been quite amazing. And that's so it's sort of like a real, it's a live place versus with that big macro landscape, it would have just been watching quite still tankers go up and down the ocean I guess you know it's, yeah you wouldn't see much detail because it was so far back um, from any anything going on this yeah. was a very introspective site and that was quite quite exposed and expressed mm. and, it, and it relied on that long view but the, this this was such a rare with the horizon is higher than you and it's only a green bowl that sits between you and that and uh, the light, the way it comes into that valley, is what you're describing, yeah. changes each day. The mist rolls up through here. I, it just seemed like it would be an endless, you know, an endless frame. Mm. Um, but also all those other things we were talking about, about the retreat, about the, the difference between something where you're kind of enveloped in the landscape or where you're exposed out into that landscape. There were other things that were being discussed that, that supported this. Yeah, and I think I think you showed us a picture of um, some contoured landscapes and, and buildings. I mm. can't remember where they were, but we had just come back from a trip overseas, which had exactly that 
contoured landscape. Um, so it's sort of, we, we found it easy to relate to what the sort of picture Paul was trying to paint for us based on basically one picture almost. Mm. It was just that connection with that our vision connected with what he was sort of trying to get us to think about and see from his perspective. Mm. Yeah. Paul, the other thing you spoke about a little, a few comments back was about neighbor, neighborliness. Mm. And I think that's a quite of interesting thing to kind of tease out in that the idea of creating a house on a site like this um, is kind of at odds with the idea of being neighborly in that it's, it's, it's a sta- you know, it's not an urbane, no. an urban setting, but you've described it. And I think it is actually incredibly potent in the, in the planning of it is that relationship between the parts, between the two sides of the building yeah. that you might be up in the study. Someone's up in the study. There's a group down by the fire, but there's a, there's a connection there that makes the, makes the site come alive in a way that would be different if it was just one set of rooms all facing into the into the landscape, as it were. Yeah. Well, I think there's uh, probably two things there. There's, there probably is the psychology of someone that has an experience of an urban setting and wondering, you know, how do you, how do you live kind of in isolation? And mm. But setting up these sort of things where, and even the material of these two buildings, which is supporting other ideas, but does set up the sort of sense of adjacency. Mm. Um, but I think uh, there, there's a yeah well there's a lot of thought that goes into the, the process about setting up other aspects of, of that. The house is in two parts, so we, I mean think about how we might describe it to someone who hasn't been here. Mm. We've arrived into the centre of the building. There's a timber side and there's a brick side. Yes. What does that tell us about the building from your point of view? Well, first of all, again that priority of the landscape that we've already talked about that that the landscape bisects the plan and then sets these up as almost secondary in a way in the house. Each half is dealing with landscape in, in a very specific way. And, and with that, whether it's grounded and anchored and the mass that comes with that, a whole set of attributes go with that. Uh, whereas uh, on the lightweight, the, the, the domestic, we've got a much more aerial. We're, we're working with contour instead of against contour. So we're sort of working with those aspects. Mm. But I think another thing that, that we were really mindful of is that quite often houses become sort of pavilions in the landscape. And, the, and you're either inside or you're outside. Yeah. And the veranda can modulate a lot of things, but it, it can't modulate that, that scale, that rapid shift of scale. But neither did we want to put something in front of the building, you know, even for the experience of the outdoor setting room. So the plan is sort of uh, conjured around this space so that the master bedroom overshoots and then creates an entertaining space, which is almost like a cave. Mm. But that, that space can then co-join with the center space and then at level with the living room to suddenly produce a space where you can comfortably have 30 or 40 people. So trying to trying to look at ways where the architecture can co- make someone feel comfortable if there's only two people or mm-hmm. three or pending five, mm-hmm. or on a day like today where there's camera crews and friends, there's, there's 30 or 40, it has to be able to adjust. It has to do all those things. So yeah, like we're just looking for opportunities in the architecture to, to do that, to tease all those things out. And at the same time, make sure it all happens if possible, in in um, collaboration with the landscape, and in the way that's about in part about making the plan work really hard. Yes. This is not a big house. No, I mean, it's a, it's a it's a generous house, but it's not a big house. No, the, gen- the, the generosity comes from making the largest rooms in the space, the outdoor space, mm. which aren't even roofs, so they're coming almost free. Um, but the plan is, yeah, it's a two hundred and twenty square meter house, so it's not very large in comparison to other houses. Mm. Um, it had to deal with a lot of things. This location, um, there's a set limit in terms of site cover. So it's, interestingly enough, it's sort of driving these sort of buildings to be multi-storey, uh, which we didn't want to do either. We had to resist that because it felt like if we went up above the tree line, suddenly we'd be communicating to another set of neighbours that we were sort of trying to be respectful of. Um, but uh, yeah, it, all these things kind of connect back to that uh, initial response <coughs> to site and to placemaking and that, that is a slightly different term for us placemaking as opposed to the architecture to the plan where mm. we're trying to do both simultaneously so we might everyone will always want to have a conversation about budget um you had a figure in mind when you started you neg- you there were you've already mentioned there were elements or moments at which things were in scope out of scope how did that negotiate uh, negotiation back and forth over the process of of design and build um, shape the project? 
Ryan, maybe you should start. Yeah, so I think it, it's the single point of where all the tension comes from, mostly yep. in my, from what I took out of it. Um, and we had to do, we did have to do a lot of work over the course of the build to adjust things to catch up on um, cost variances that, you know, just, I think there was some around steel that we didn't see. So we had a pretty good process where um, I would probably a bit too abruptly ring Paul up and say, well, we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> um, and then he would like try and work a way around it. Yeah. He wouldn't answer straight away. And invariably it would involve Stephen, the builder who's here yeah. to sort of probably help us with Triangulate. solutions. Yeah. yeah. So it was, it was really important to have a good builder like Stephen that could do that. But we, we worked really hard to, I was pretty yeah. brutal on if there was a cost that um, came unexpectedly, then I would try and take something out. I think we ended up um, 4% over or something. It wasn't too bad an overspend, um, but it was it was a hard process, but at least everyone came at it from an understanding of what we were gaining and losing. So from your point of view, Ryan, is that was that the biggest challenge of the project is is keeping an eye on the on the budget through the sort of ups and downs of this of the process? I don't think keeping an eye on, the, on it is the hard part. It's finding the right solutions that um, we're not aware of as clients that, you know, because you can, you can be a bit too gung-ho and make a mistake that you're going to regret mm. um, in the long run. So I think the hard part was trusting everyone involved that um, you don't... So it's sort of coming at it from, I don't know what I don't know, mm. and I'm going to trust the ones that do know to have input into the solution. But do it all together and just, you know, Paul may not know certain things that we, um, that we, you know, we maybe kept out of the brief. I don't know, but I think it's as well, something that on you the might be page, prepared to compromise on and some things you wouldn't be prepared yeah, to compromise so, on. Yeah, so, you know, there's, we won't go into the details of some of the good, good stories, yeah. but, um, you know, like, I mean, I think there's, there's a process really leading up to the tender and, and even then, you know, you're jockeying for position and priority. There was, there was a desire to have a lot lot of local stone. There's a lot of local materials in this building. The timber's local and the stone's local and using local skills when we mm. could. And some of that had to, you know, had to be kind of worked through and, and out and other things. And then we we're on site and Ryan was there every day. Like he's like a project manager in his own right. And, and so I think his experience of the budget and management was day to day, which is different for most clients. Mm. And so I think he really saw hopefully the rigor of how things do turn up and then the, the knee-jerk response isn't always the, the only avenue and you have to find a way and in the end the budget is finite mm. and you have to manage that so if something's got to give what what is it and then there's another conversation that follows that one but um i think a lot of the positioning actually goes on well well before that point and in the conversation about how how we go and there was a lot of things that couldn't be extracted from this budget and it's i don't think it's a an extremely high budget for a house of this size, but but we do have a lot of servicing here. Mm. Um, mm. Even though we've got our own power, we had to run cable all the way through to the road, and we had to do a whole lot of things. Those were all givens, you know. They're, they're not exchangeable. So, mm. you know, how do you go from there? How do you how do you how do you do the best you can working from that? Mm. I think I think a good reflection on the success we had in managing that was that we haven't had to do anything in the few years after to to fix up a, oh my God, why did we take that, that out? You yeah. know? So I think we found the right solution in most cases. Yeah. So Ryan, you engaged Paul right through the process. So you were on site, sounds like, quite in a quite a hands-on way. Paul, how often were you visiting site during construction? I think on regularly, at least every two weeks, uh, if not. So there was other architects, obviously there's a much bigger team than yep. just mm. myself and Laura was in the project and others. So we were, we were up here I'd say at least once every fortnight and uh, every month there was some some fairly heavy lifting going on at those meetings but mm -hmm. it's also about other relationships the builders here Stephen was exceptional really got on well hadn't worked with him before so you have to go through all those sort of uh, processes again and learn each other's foibles and 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 also when they're gonna put their hand up and ask for help and when they're gonna keep going yeah. um, but just I think the house speaks of the success of all those relationships and and there are so many hands involved in making a house and it's quite extraordinary really that somehow we get them all to align it's like stroking the magnet over all the pieces and they all start to face the one direction and and when it does then good things happen 
so what you talked about the builder, but there's obviously other consultants that you've got involved in mm. a project like this. Yeah, How so did you assemble that that those filings that the magnet pulled along? <laughs> well, uh, we had engineers, Bly Tanner. Mm -hmm. um, we'd worked with them before on other projects in Brisbane. Uh, there were a couple of local um, consultants. Um, so some sometimes through existing relationships, sometimes we were introduced to people. Yeah. Uh, going out and finding the stone, you know, literally going along and seeing friends work and seeing they'd used and then finding out through local knowledge almost, you know, where do we get this from? How do we get that? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that's a, almost like a little bit of a research project that you embarked on together. Yeah, very much yeah, so. And so. Some Paul was providing or initiating and some like Stonemason Jim, we resourced and sort of then Jim had to talk to Paul, I guess, and they needed to connect and understand about what kind of stone and how Jim did his work. Yeah. Um, but I can count on, you know, five, I think, key conversations that we had to have here on site to sort out some big things. And one involved the bricklayer doing some really interesting corner um, angles that we did. I, I can still <laughs> vi vividly remember that conversation, like almost word for word. Um, the concrete um, laying and getting ready for the polishing aspect was was super interesting for me to watch. I didn't have anything to do with that, but you could see the value of having a conversation on site and having Paul there to, you know, it wouldn't have, it would have been different if he was based in Brisbane doing that on the t on the phone. Um, there was yeah you know, the stone, and then there was a few other things that that we needed to sort out here and without the site visits. So uh, I, I like the idea of getting right down to that level of detail in terms of our conversation. So there's a there's a there's this, there's a decision that has to be made on site about some aspect of the way the bricks are being laid. Oh yeah. What's the decision? <laughs> uh, well, again, what, are you, what are you trying What are you trying to reconcile, negotiate, facilitate there? Well, again, the, there's already been a research project in terms of how we selected this brick and how we would run the mortar joints and how we do that, and then we met the uh, the the bricklayer on site and. He's describing them as one thing and doing something else. And then we get to these points that we've got details. But then I think part of our process is we do really love engaging with craftsmen, with builders. And so if it's a, well, we could do it this way and achieve this or that, then we're really keen to hear that and, and, and work it out. It'd be great if we could have heard it before now. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah. uh, let's work through that and then let's see how we, we manage that on site. And that's that's a sort of fluidity, which... Um, I think in a way, again, Ryan did very well to, to manage because it, it, for some people it would it would be disarming. But no, I think most of them were much more like, okay, well, this is what we thought the situation was going to be. This is what's presenting itself now. How do we move with that and how do we still get the outcomes, but maybe we do it via a different path? Mm -hmm. And that, that happens on a lot of our projects. And, I, and we're really open to learning ourselves as we go through. Um, you know, we've, got the, we've definitely got a clear idea of what, where we're trying to get, but, but there's always a different way of doing it. So would you say in every project you you are learning something new? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we push ourselves to include things and do things that we haven't done on every other project. And you don't tell clients that until you get no. to this point. <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, on this job, there's at least four things we, we had, you know, hadn't done before and, and, and we're moving with it and learning on the are job. Are you going to tell us what the four no, are? No. <laughs> I might be able to guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So on every project, there there are yeah. Again, this this brings us right back to the question of a practicing from a position. Yes. That that, that in each project re there is that simultaneous refining of your own trajectory and architecture and delivering. Yes. On a very specific client brief site. Well, I mean, the plan itself engenders one set of details and responses, but mm. materiality. So in twenty years, this is only the second brick that I've ever picked up. So we, we went back through that process. That was something that Brooklyn had, I think, in her mind and, and a material, and it went straight. As soon as we started talking about the fire and the anchoring and the, and the groundedness, it was something that we had to maybe let go of some of our uh, preconceptions mm -hmm. about. But I, I also have a fantastic kind of early memory of this place as, a, as, a, as an area uh, of those expat communities and these kind of quite odd buildings and quite odd accents that we would visit and I came away thinking I'd been overseas where I'd only just been up the road. But So you visited this area oh, as a, a lot young person. as a child, as yeah. a child. And and that remaking of the kind of the houses from be it Europe or, or other places that was also intrinsic. Because of the climate, the expat community gravitated here and they wanted to remake. And there's there's something of a node to those buildings in, in this half of the house, which I recognized halfway through the project as well. 
which is also responding to local context in, in, a, in a kind of different way. Did that connection with this part of the world come up in those early conversations that you and Brooklyn had with, with Paul? Yeah, I think you, um, you were just finishing a house up uh, in, was it Budrum? Yeah, we've, we've just yeah. finished one there. So we talked, that was sort of the way we talked through Paul's connection of this, this area and understanding, which is important for us. It's one of the things that we sort of, okay, that's good. I mean, no, I know you could post-rationalise the duality, but you've also got someone from North Queensland mm. and someone from down Tasmania. And and those two references are here in this house as well, you know, different sensibilities about where you occupy yep. and that, that are all those things. I think I'm sure they're just elements that reinforce those early diagrams and sketches, but um, yeah, they just keep getting layered into the to the thinking of the project. And I think from, from my perspective around your question of, to, does the architect learn and try new things on a house? Well, that's why you engage an architect in in my perspective, from mm. my perspective, you don't sort of, you know, I didn't want Paul just to do a cookie cutter of his last one. I wanted him to create and be artistic. Um, so I think, you know, that's probably a key lesson. If you, you've got to trust the architect to have that opportunity to, to do new things and find some new new styles mm. and But we, we, we put forward four, designs at the beginning of this and this was by far and away the most radical the most challenging even with the budget we had and we all knew we would be pushing ourselves the whole team um but brooklyn and ryan well uh, that's the one mm. <laughs> and uh, and and you know and that was that your if, preferred if, option yes it was of course but it but there, there were other uh there were other strategies that we thought could work <coughs> excuse me but um mm. But it's in that moment that you go, right, well, you know, this is really, we're all going to be holding hands and walking into the night now. So, um, so let's do it. Yeah. So, Ryan, this is the first time you and Brooklyn have worked with an architect. Yep. Um, what advice, advice, someone about, who's about to pick up the phone and yeah. call Paul on Monday morning and yep. say, um, I'm interested in, in working with you. What advice would you give someone at that moment that they're contemplating engaging an architect, especially if they're doing so perhaps for the first time? Yeah, I think focusing on um, the point of can you have a relationship with that person is the most important thing. Um, don't don't focus too much on uh, can they build what you know what it is in our mind or can they build it for design it for our cost or it's more about the relationship because things are going to happen um, that you you will rely on that relationship to solve rather than starting off with the matched idea of you know the exact cost and, and design so mm -hmm. i would focus on a relationship can you have a good quality relationship and do you sort of share the same um not exactly the same values but sort of but there's an element of that an isn't element there? of the same sort of um beliefs and and values yeah and if they can't understand generally what you write down in your brief or you tell them in your brief then um that's sort of a, the critical point to me mm -hmm. I need to understand you and then you need to equally sort of have a good idea of how they're going to work. Hmm. Paul, do you lay that, 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 that foundation of, for success, which is clearly evident here, how, how hard is that worked on in the first few, you know, few weeks, months of a project? Is it, is it something that you're, you're conscious of and refining in addition to the project of sitting at your desk and, and, and drawing? Uh, yes, and, and I think it carries all the way through to what we were just talking about before. You're on site, you're still refining. Mm. Um, it's about a delivery. It's so lovely to come back after a little while and, and enjoy it in a completely different way and to see how much uh, the clients have been true to that vision as well and the way that they're living in it and they're doing, you know, not necessarily things the way you'd expect them to, but the way they're enjoying it. That embrace of the, the broader landscape that's going on now—it's just—it's uh, it's fab fabulous. So even coming back today, you're continuing to learn and refine oh, yeah, through I the caught, process. I, I caught a view that I hadn't seen before, which was lovely. Yeah, um, but we're, yeah, I mean, we, we're going through, and for us, it's a it's a construct that we're already familiar with the whole way through. I mean, the huge leap of faith that clients so is that they haven't got that mind's eye view. So, you know, uh, so much of what we do is an affirmation of what we're already where we're there, but how you bring clients through with that or how clients rise to that is, is that's the success in many ways because the architecture can realize itself um, but but having people believe in it and come through that process with you yeah that's very different but um, 
we approach it differently with different people. And I think, you know, Brooklyn and Ryan, are, uh, we took time to get to know each other. This project was so much in the where we would put the building that we were probably two months in before we even realized where the house would go. By the time we got to that point, I think we'd already worked through so many of the other issues that we might have faced talking about the, the program. That is a very beautiful and poetic place to finish our conversation this afternoon. Um, would you please join me in thanking Paul and Ryan? It's been a thoroughly enjoyable conversation um, and an absolutely beautiful place to spend a Saturday afternoon. So congratulations to you both on um, this incredible project. Um, and we look forward to the next one of these conversations and to the upcoming Sunshine Coast um, open house event. So thanks again. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you.